and welcome back to ANN News Kids. This week on the main headlines, we have countries threatening to boycott the 2024 Paris Olympics, the EU and Ukraine's membership in the EU, the Chinese surveillance balloon, and the Hong Kong Initiative. Hello Hong Kong! This week we have our 100th interview and we are interviewing Mr. Alan Shaheen, who is an incredible person with a fantastic journey. He was the Vice President of Digital Engineering in Cognizant and has years of experience. I hope you learn a lot from him. In the secondary headlines, we have the Russia-Ukraine invasion, the freezing temperatures in northeastern USA, and Elon Musk case cleared. I really hope you enjoy. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment below because we are trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. Thank you very much. Ministers from countries like Poland, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania are protesting the participation of Russian and Belarusian players during the 2024 Olympics in Paris. They are threatening that they will boycott this Olympics if Russian and Belarusian players are allowed to compete. During the 10th February meeting between sport ministers, there might be a conclusion that these players will not be allowed to compete. Although the IOC has proposed with a few solutions. One of them is that these players come as a neutral flag from no country and just playing for themselves. This way it might not offend anybody and at least the players who might be boycotted will be able to play as well. It's also not fair that the Russian and Belarusian players would not be allowed to play because they didn't do anything wrong and sports and politics should not mix. The EU officials have announced that Ukraine's future lies in the EU and they have praised Kyiv for its reforms towards EU's status during a joint press conference with the President of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky. They have not set a date for when the, e when the EU can welcome Ukraine, although the President is trying to fast track the process, trying to get it done by this year. Germany has already given the Leopard 1 tanks, which will be arriving soon, and they've already promised the Leopard 2 tanks, which also will be arriving in the next months. Ever since the war began, the Ukraine has been trying to get into the EU and although it usually takes a long process, they are trying to accelerate it. A high altitude balloon, believed to be a Chinese surveillance balloon, is now circling the US and is being tracked by officials. It was spotted over Montana, a state in the USA, but the officials also said that it does not pose a physical threat or an intelligence gathering threat at all. It's a size of three buses and it's pretty high. The Secretary of State of US, Anthony Blinken, also postponed his trip to Beijing in response to this situation. And it seems like the tensions between US and China are escalating. In order to revive its tourism industry, the Hong Kong government has started the Hello Hong Kong initiative. This initiative includes giving away 500,000 free airline tickets to come to Hong Kong. It's going to be taking place through a lottery system and will begin in March, March 1st. There will be three phases, starting with Southeast Asia in March, then mainland China in April and in May the rest of the world. It's very exciting but this cost the city 254.8 million dollars. The tickets will be distributed amongst the three biggest airlines in Hong Kong. During the COVID-19 pandemic Hong Kong had a lot of 
precautions and now those won't be needed anymore. That's why it was very expensive to travel before, but now they're trying to open their borders and get people back. Hello everyone, this week for our 100th APAYC interview, we are interviewing Mr. Alan Shaheen, a fantastic person who has had an incredible journey. During this interview, he talks about his career, how he goes on about choosing a job, and how he has learned so much through his years of experience. I'm sure that all of us can learn from him, and we really hope you enjoy. My name is Alan Shaheen. Uh, I was born in the United States, although my parents came to the United States in the 1950s from Lebanon. So they were immigrants and I'm the son of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And that was always something that I held as an important part of my life. And it was something that was very helpful in my career because I had an international perspective. I remember mm -hmm. that I didn't really have that much money growing up. So my family would save up uh, every year and we would get back to Lebanon uh, probably every eight to 10 years uh, after we had put together wow. enough money we'd go on a family vacation. But it was really important that we did that because again, I stayed connected with family and I still have mm -hmm. family connections in Lebanon. But from a career perspective, as I mentioned, it gave me the opportunity to see things from many different perspectives, from different mm -hmm. cultural lenses, rather than a single point of view. It also mm -hmm. gave me the opportunity to learn several languages, and that yeah. has been helpful throughout my career as well. So, grew up in a, uh, a local environment in the United States, in mm -hmm. Virginia, which is sort of in the, the middle of the East Coast of the United States. Again, um, a socioeconomically diverse neighborhood. So, mm -hmm. the schools that I went to, it was really a struggle. Not many of the people in our schools went on to university, maybe 25 or 30 percent. Oh. But my parents were very, very insistent on education and it being critically important. Mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough to do well in school and I was fortunate enough to get into Harvard. I went to Harvard um, University. <laughs> and, uh, you know, from there, I, uh, my parents insisted that I become an engineer. And that was because as immigrants, they saw that being an engineer was a way to have a steady, secure income, much the way that families and parents in India, especially, look at their children and tell them, you must be a software engineer because that is the steady profession that will make your life easier as time goes on. But the truth of the matter is, I was more interested in many other topics, but I listened to my family at the time and did engineering. And at the same time, took many, many courses in other areas of interest. And that was history, government, politics, uh, literature, and I continue to maintain those interests and read a lot. And that's been another part of my journey over the course of my career and my life is I love to learn and have maintained a real discipline in learning throughout my life. Mm -hmm. So after graduating, I was a teaching assistant for mm -hmm. about six months or so, trying to figure out where I was going to work. And then I took a job at a company that was a training company. Mm -hmm. So did that for a while. And with a few people in that company, developed a new software development methodology we were doing Agile before Agile was born. We were the antecedents mm -hmm. of Agile. You know, again, I was in Boston at the time, and the mm -hmm. company that I was at had a mix of Harvard, MIT, Northeastern, Boston University students. And so all of us mm -hmm. were pretty intense. And we came up with this new side of software development that was very human-centric. Until mm -hmm. that wow. time software had been developed in a way that it was just documentation oriented, very specific mm -hmm. requirements. And we created a model where users and technology were well integrated. So that 
developed into a company called Cambridge Technology Partners. Mm -hmm. I worked there for a number of years and then after a while decided to leave and do something else. And I am a big believer in fate. And so as fate would have it, uh, two years later, I was traveling at an airport and ended up being on a plane with some old colleagues from Cambridge, as well as the new chief operating officer. He and I talked, got together, and he said, why don't you join us? And so uh, I did. I took a trip to Lebanon that summer to get myself ready and then came back to, uh, to Cambridge and for the next six years worked as hard as I ever have in my entire life. We took the company yeah. public and yeah. I uh, worked with a lot of great people. And I then moved from Boston to Los Angeles and started our first office outside of Boston and then moved from uh, Los Angeles to Stockholm and did that uh, for a year and Mm -hmm. then got married when I was 35 and Mm -hmm. moved to London. And so my wife and I spent a couple of years in London Mm -hmm. and uh, back to Boston. And it was around the time that the dot-com bubble was all over the place. And I got an opportunity as CEO of a Mm -hmm. software startup company. I did that for a couple of years right at the time when the internet collapsed. And at that time, uh, you know, unfortunately, I was in a place where I had to keep shrinking the company until we finally sold it. And, you know, essentially, it was a failure. Okay. (laughs) And I will tell you that I was devastated by that when it happened and took a while to really um, step back and try to figure out why it happened and what I learned from it. So I took a few years where I didn't join any other company. I was just doing independent consulting. Fortunately, I had done well at Cambridge financially. Mm -hmm. And so for four or five years, I was just do projects that I enjoyed. I had convinced myself I was never, ever going to work with a large company again. Uh, Several (laughs) years later, I got a call from a former employee who asked me to be a reference at a couple of opportunities, one being Cognizant and another being a startup. I knew the board members at both of those companies, and they had asked specifically for my reference. And I got a call from the COO at Cognizant. I was traveling in the Middle East at the time, and we talked, and it was a great conversation. And he, in fact, said, okay what are you doing right now? And I told him I was doing independent consulting and he asked if I was interested in joining Cognizant. I told him, no, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm done with large companies, but I will do consulting. And so, you know, this person was Francisco D'Souza, who eventually became our CEO, was one of the founders. I started doing consulting and the consulting that I started doing was really helping educate the client partners on how to do customer engagement and how to build new practices. Lakshmi Narayanan was the CEO at the time, and Frank Mm -hmm. was the COO. And I got to work with some incredible people. Chandra Shekharan was the, you know, India leader, and I got to meet Chandra as well. And so as time went on, I... I had five clients and then I had three clients and then I had one client and that was Cognizant. And mm-hmm. it became a situation where Frank just said, look, you know, it's silly that you are not part of us. And so um, I joined and mm-hmm. I did that for 16 years and wow. in a variety of different roles. From the beginning, you know, you've been moving around different sectors and Mm -hmm. quite a few different places you've worked in. Did you always know what you wanted to do or where you would end up? Did you always want want to go into tech or were you um, more inclined to education? Could you tell us a bit more about what you thought you would do versus where where you've come so far? So what I enjoyed doing was education and training. I loved Mm -hmm. that. Okay. And always had, when I was in high school, um, I used to tutor people and that was uh, great fun. Um, 
when I went to college, as I mentioned, my parents pushed me into engineering and the sciences yeah. and so forth. And, uh, you know, I, I did that. And I figured out that technology is cool and it's very interesting, but I was much more interested in the application of technology. How can we use it both for the betterment of business and the betterment of humanity in general? Mm -hmm. And so I wasn't really a technologist in the classical sense. It wasn't my top choice in terms of careers. So mm -hmm. I never thought that that would happen, mm -hmm. uh, that I would go into technology. But what I did is I learned what aspect of technology I was interested in and what aspect of technology I felt like I could have a important impact. Now, so for me, what was important was learning, enjoying mm -hmm. what I was doing, and having a positive impact in whatever company and with whatever client I mm -hmm. happen to be working with. And so that's the way that I managed my career. There were times, of course, that I would say, gosh, I want to get that job um, yeah. you know, because it's bigger and it's more interesting. But I never really sat there and charted my career to say, in three years, I'm going to be a senior manager. In five mm -hmm. years, I'm going to be a director and, and things of that sort. And I never said to myself, you're going to be working in this industry with this kind of role and, you know, and so forth. Mm -hmm. But I will tell you that Whenever I took on a role, there are five things that I would think about, okay? You know, the first thing that I would think about would be the type of work itself. Do mm -hmm. I enjoy what I'm going to be doing? Um, is it the technology that I'm enjoying? Is it the type of business process that I'm going to be mm -hmm. doing? Is it the type of industry that I'm going to be working with, et cetera? Um, am I going to be learning? The second thing is the type of role. Am I going to be an individual contributor? Am I going to be a manager? Is it going to be something that is in technology or sales or operations or any type of role such as that? The yeah. third, which is critically important, is culture. Do I like the way the people interact? What are their principles? What is their perspective on the role of business and this mm -hmm. organization in helping society? Uh, how do people treat one another? Is it a learning-based culture, et cetera? And then there is what I call the ambition factor. What is my opportunity to uh, be recognized, to be paid, to get a great title, to be seen internally and externally and so forth? And then the fifth is lifestyle. And that is, um, what are the hours like? Um, mm -hmm. uh, what is travel like? Can I work remotely? Yeah. Can I work um, in the office? How much travel there is? Is it difficult travel? And so forth. And all of these things change over time. You know, how you prioritize each one changes over time. But I always looked at that framework to help me determine what I was going to be doing next. And in fact, every year at Cognizant, I would go back at the end of the year and the beginning of the new year and say, does this still fit? And so that is what, um, what I use to help me figure out if I was in the right place at the right time. Wow, that's great. Wow, and despite not ever imagining yourself having a career in technology, you did end up working in Cognizant for a large chunk of your career. So even though you're not working there anymore, what did you love about your job that made you stay there? The reason that I was able to stay 16 years, because candidly, when I took the job, I was like, I'll do this for four or five years and then see what I do next, was because I had a great relationship with Frank and the leadership team. I loved the culture of the organization. Mm -hmm. And I also um, 
had a good enough sense of myself to know what I enjoyed doing and what I didn't. Mm -hmm. And Frank and I talked about that several times and he knew how to deploy me. And so I would do something for two to three years and then move on to something else. So in those 16 years, I probably had five different jobs or six different jobs. And that's what kept it interesting and exciting and different. The past seven years, the last seven years that I was there, what I enjoyed doing the most was really helping others succeed and elevating the people that I worked with to the next level. The greatest satisfaction that I had was seeing people who had worked with me and Mm -hmm. see them at higher levels, achieving and realizing more of their potential. And Bippin was one of those people that I got the opportunity to work with. And Mm -hmm. he kept me very, very busy. Uh, You know, I'll have to tell you. Wow. Uh, you know, but, but I will tell you that life changes as a company gets bigger. Um, mm-hmm. you know, culture has to change as well. There are core elements and core principles that don't, and you've got to make sure that you stay true to those principles. But the way you operate at a $10 million company is very different than how you operate at a billion dollar company or a five billion or a ten billion dollar company. Mm-hmm. And so things changed a great deal. And as time went on, I found myself running larger and larger organizations. Mm-hmm. And at one point told Frank, you know, it's getting boring doing this stuff. And so uh, I ran our mergers and acquisitions team for mm-hmm. a while. I ran our uh, new resource development and delivery center development in North America for a while. I I did a variety of of different things. But gradually, as the custom um, software work started to grow and technology in general started to to grow, I got to a place where I was running large organizations And it took me away from what I really, really love to do, which is consulting, love to work with clients, understand their problems, figure out how to do solutions collaboratively with them. And now what I was doing is spending a lot of time with spreadsheets and with partners and with analysts, which is fun. Uh, But the spreadsheets, I didn't really like that much. And so I got to a point where I was like, okay, now it's time to move on and do something different. And I left Cognizant about three months ago, a little bit more, almost four months now, and have just been enjoying life, doing some of the things that I hadn't been able to do in the times when I was incredibly busy with family and work. And so for the first time in my life, I started doing yoga and that's fantastic. I have started reading again uh, in in ways uh, that I hadn't had a chance to in, uh, you know, in quite a while. And I've gotten back to those basic principles that I really enjoy, being mm-hmm. very close to specific projects, specific clients, really getting my hands onto something and having a direct impact with people and businesses and, and so forth. And um, you know, as you get further on in your career, if you are wise, you really get to understand what you're good at, what you enjoy, and gravitate more and more towards those things. Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm taking the opportunity to do right now. I'm also spending the rest of my time doing something that I have enjoyed from the very early parts of my childhood, and that's teaching. And so Mm -hmm. I'm starting to get back into teaching and Mm -hmm doing things that involve education. And so that's great, great fun because I feel like it's influencing and hopefully positive the the lives of younger people and getting them to a place where they, more than anything, gain greater confidence in themselves, Mm -hmm. what they believe in, and feel confident enough with their intuition so that when they feel something is wrong, they speak up. And when they feel something is right, they speak up. And this is where I had to learn on my own very early on that, you know, 
you start a job and you think that, oh my God, my first job, I've got to make this fantastic impression. So I'm going to be nice and I'm going to make sure that I agree with everything. And I found that in those times when my intuition told me this doesn't work, <laughs> it turned out to be correct. And I learned over the years to trust myself. And that really helped in my career development. Yeah. And so I would say to young people, and I did a lot of speaking for new employees that would come into the organization, trust yourself and speak up when you feel something is important, you go to others, mm -hmm. and you go to your management and you speak up. The other thing that I would say is that people oftentimes focus on career development as an upward track. And I think it's really important to understand that enjoying what you do on a day-to-day -day basis is more than 75% of the deal. <laughs> and too many people, I think, forget that along the way, and they will look back on their career and think, that wasn't that much fun. And so I never really planned my career. I was fortunate enough to be in good places, but I learned yeah. what I enjoyed doing and tried to gravitate towards that. And I did so naturally. And mm -hmm. I found that you can do just about anything for a couple of years, but then after that, if it's not consistent with your principles, you're going to mm -hmm. find that it takes more and more energy to go into work every day. And mm -hmm. so I came to the point where life is just too important to, to live that way. Yeah, that, that was yeah. amazing. Your journey so far has been incredible. Yeah. Um, and it feels like you've made a full circle from Harvard teaching and now to teaching again into education. That's that's really nice. And could you tell us a bit about how Lebanon and going to Lebanon um, gave you that different perspective you were talking about at the beginning? Well, it <clears throat> you know, it's very easy to live in your own world and think that's the only world that exists. <clears throat> and, <laughs> In the United States, it's especially easy because you have so many opportunities in the United States. It's so broad and it is itself very diverse. And so you get, you get different perspectives, but we live in a place that is in many cases isolated geographically. And so going to different countries and going to Lebanon in particular gave me a way to understand a completely different point of view, where Lebanon is a very small country and is driven by others around it and has to think about how to navigate and how to balance between different allies and enemies. You know, the United States is a huge and very powerful company, uh, country, and it tends to drive the world. And so that very different perspective from a large superpower, super business power to a small country that is amazing in its own way, but has to think about what the larger countries are doing and what the political winds are blowing and what ways they need to adapt rather than creating the system that others much must adapt to. So, you know, it gave me a very different point of view, whereas in the United States, you can think of, hey, we're all powerful and mm -hmm. economically, politically, militarily. Going to Lebanon helped me realize how decisions that we make in the United States affect others and yeah. to start to think about others and the impact that we have, rather than blindly going and doing something. And the way that impacted my career is that as I got into higher and higher roles, you know, there were people that worked for me and worked with me. And I would oftentimes ask for things, not realizing 
how much work it took. But because of my background in going to Lebanon, I would always ask, so what is this going to take? Is this going to kill people? You know, I don't want people working over the weekends 24-7 to get this done. So I'd mm -hmm. always try to frame it to say, look, this is what's priority, and I really need you to work hard to do this. But this is something that get it done in a way that doesn't kill anyone. Uh, and it can wait a week or two weeks mm -hmm. or whatever the case may be. But the idea is great leaders understand the work that their teams are doing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great workers understand the purpose of what they're doing. Great leaders mm -hmm. help their teams understand vision and purpose mm -hmm. and why. And I will tell you that over the years, I've done a lot of different promotions and assessments and ratings for people. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes when it comes to ratings, I will just walk around offices and just stop and ask people what they are doing. And it's very interesting how people answer that question so differently. One person can answer it and saying, I am doing this great, amazing Java programming. Um, and what we've been doing is creating these stacks and arrays and pointers and all the rest of recursive loops. And that has really challenged me technically. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Then I will go to someone on the same project who will explain to me, well, what we're trying to do is create a banking system that helps clients of the bank do deposits mm -hmm. remotely and securely. And in order to do that, this is the technology architecture that we have to use. We chose Java because it is the most relevant language and the mm -hmm. systems that we use, et cetera, et cetera. One person is fantastic and mm -hmm. will go into a career that is more focused on technology. You know, the other person understands the what and the why along with the how. Mm -hmm. And that person takes a broader perspective. And I think it's important to do that. And so I would tend to accelerate those individuals more rapidly because they get the bigger picture and are able to mm -hmm. engage with clients and with colleagues and with partners more effectively. Mm -hmm. And so, again, the advice that I would give you is make sure that when you're doing something, you know why. And if you don't, seek it out. And if your leaders mm -hmm. don't know, then you've got a problem. <laughs> and you should think about if you're in a place that has the right kind of leadership. Wow, that's great. And you must have learned and you varied so much throughout your life and career until now. And could you pass on one or two pieces of advice to the next generation? Learn to trust yourself <laughs> is... I think the first one, which I mentioned, and I'll say it again because it is critically important. Yeah. The second is to, to really put learning and enjoyment and impact at the top of your list mm -hmm. and the rest will come. The job advancement the financials will come. And if you don't have the first mm -hmm. set, then getting the other can feel a little bit hollow. Right. So those are the bits of advice that I would give young people along the way. I'm so impressed with the young people that we have coming into the workforce, that we have coming into society and so forth. And I would say that you have so much to give and step back and think what that is and how you're going to find the best expression of it through your work. Okay. Wow. And, and remember that work is an important part of your life. You spend mm -hmm. a lot of time with it and that should reinforce for you how important it is to enjoy it and have it be impactful rather than just something that you do for eight or 10 or whatever number of hours per day. 
So true. Thank you so much for your time today. It was really nice listening to you. Uh, and we learned so much. Thank you so much. We really so, feel like we've interviewed you. So Nitya and Anna, it's people like you and all of the other young people that I've gotten a chance to work with that really give me encouragement for the future. And so thank you for the opportunity to say some things. And I look forward to being part of your blog and seeing what's going on and uh, learning from you about what the next generation is thinking. Thank you so much. That okay. means a lot. Have a wonderful day. Yes, you too. Bye now. Bye. Goodbye. Russia is bringing its war with Ukraine closer to the industrial cities. And now they've been firing missiles into residential areas and people, civilians who are still there are getting hurt. They just fired two S-300 missiles less than a minute apart in the center of Kramatorsk, a city in the industrial area of Ukraine. They also fired different missiles which killed at least nine people, although no other fatalities have been reported yet. Now the governor, military governor of some of the cities are, is also advising all the civilians who are still there to leave the country and it's a matter of life and death. Although it's very unfortunate that many civilians cannot afford to leave the country and are facing the brunt of the war. A record-breaking deep freeze is hitting the states along the northeastern side of USA and that's causing 80 million people to suffer from cold temperatures. The National Weather Service said that these temperatures can cause a frostbite in under 10 minutes and already 10 people have died. This could be because of climate change as last year there was a Texas cold wave that also caused a lot of damage. But now these things are becoming more and more frequent. In many states because of sub-zero temperatures schools and work is closed. And many homes more than 320,000 have been left without power. There have also been a lot of road accidents despite the government telling people to stay off the roads. A few people have been injured and some died as well because of that. Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, was in trouble because of a tweet he wrote in 2018. He wrote that he had enough money to make Twitter, Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla, was in trouble because of a tweet that he wrote in 2018. In that tweet, he wrote that he had enough money to make Tesla a private company, although people who had a part of Tesla and who owned some shares did not believe him and sued him for lying to them and tricking them. After some time, a case was opened to find out if Elon Musk was telling the truth or not, and in the end, it was found that that he was telling the truth and that he indeed did have enough money to make Twitter into a private company at that time. And even though the case was closed and his name was cleared, Elon Musk, the people who sued him, were still really mad about it. And now some people still think that something fishy happened and that something wrong did indeed happen.